Well, that was screwed up, folks. Um, <laughs> yeah, welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm Fred McMurray. It's 2 p.m. Pacific. It's Thursday, which means this does have to be... All right, enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> we already had the music earlier and that wonderful little whatever it was. Ooh, it's a, it must have been a rough hump day, huh, Fred? Uh, yeah, it been, yeah, rough week, long week, whatever, a good week, whatever. We made progress. What can I say? What's, a, what's the word on the street, over. ladies? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so... Elizabeth, you know, one of my favorite places to go for lunch or dinner, it doesn't really matter. And the irony of this is I always think, oh, let's go here because I can get a healthy bowl, right? Mm -hmm. It's Chipotle. Now, yeah. granted, by the time I'm done filling my bowl, it's still over <laughs> a thousand calories. because <laughs> I can't go anywhere without the sour cream and the guacamole and the cheese. But it's so, it's fresh, so it doesn't back oh for something. It's so good. But... <laughs> You know, I've talked before about um, the one area of McDonald's that I go to and how they automated the drive through and how it makes me crazy because I order a large iced tea unsweetened and it always goes, what? And then I have to talk to a real person anyway. And so I figure like, what the hell is the point with automation if they don't understand me? Right. Now, to combat the workforce shortage, I was just reading that Chipotle wants to go into essentially, almost, full automation and i'm so disappointed because honestly i kind of like going through the line and talking to the people even though they don't all roll the burrito the same um, <laughs> i enjoy wait a part. second is can you say that on on roll the burrito is that a acceptable phrase it is not a euphemism it is a literal description of how they create food so oh. i mean right i don't on. know what goes on <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what goes on in the California ones, Fred, but I mean, <laughs> here in Illinois, we're just talking food. A burrito is a burrito, right? Yeah. I don't know. I think here. that's non-politically correct. I'm going to have to research uh, that. <laughs> okay, well, here's well, the funny right thing. Here's the, here's the interesting thing, Kristen. When we were talking about this, I went to look up um, what they were doing. And what I came across was this long list of articles about Chipotle and automation and labor shortages and, and their philosophy of, of business. And in 2012, there was an article out where they were heavily resisting anything automated. Um, in fact, I've got the quote right here. The, the quote is, I hope the experience of coming into Chipotle and ordering on the line is substantially superior to ordering on the phone. There's all this communication as you watch what's being made. So that was part of their business model was to have people in the line, seeing the fresh food, making it customized you know to what you yep. wanted so that was where they were going and then in the next yeah. iteration of google searches it starts showing them struggling with worker shortage like every other business is, and they started yeah. to offer um, they started talking about oh it's all about our people it's people 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 they started offering educational benefits you know yeah. more compensation they had more you know they were sending kids to school and not having them pay interest you know they're going to pay for all these things trying to create that incentive for them to work and then mm -hmm. the third phase when you look through the history of it, it seems to be that they're now having to embrace this automation because they still aren't having yeah. the workers and isn't it sad because you know we've talked several times about um it's not about the money it's about the why and it's about something bigger than just the wage and so one would think in theory and certainly when i was a around the age that i would probably most be interested in working at chipotle I mean, having somebody help me pay for my schooling is huge. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe what they need to do is offer it to people who are carrying student debt rather than trying to get kids who are currently interested in going to school, try to get the, the folks that are carrying, it, carrying a debt and help them pay it off as they go. Maybe that would work. But yeah, I think it's, it's really, it's probably indicative of, well, not only is it indicative of just the marketplace, the job the job market in and of itself, but it makes me nervous in terms of, though Chipotle is not a franchise, 
you know, is this paving the way for franchise QSRs as, as we go? Are we going to see more automation? And I mean, I don't think this labor shortage is here to stay forever. I mean, eventually there are people who are going to need and want to go back to work. So then what happens? We've replaced people with automated. Well, and, you know, that's one of the biggest fears of, of, I think, older generations looking to where we are now was that everything would be automated and automated people out of jobs. And here we are because of the worker, you know, the labor shortage, for whatever reason, people aren't engaging with these offers of benefits and things like that. So it is, it's an interesting, weird thing, but it was really weird to look at the the long history in Google search and see the evolution of, of their change. I just want to point out that you said older and, and I, I did just hit 50, but the fact that you put me in the older and 50 category, I'm going to try not to be upset because we're there together. We are, we are almost exactly the same, but I was even thinking more of my parents' generation when they, yeah. when they started assembly line things or even before, yeah. you know, yeah. when things became more and more automated throughout the industrial revolution and beyond, that's true. one of yes. the fears was that there were not going to be jobs for people. You look at the Jetsons and they have a robotic mate, right? right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, it's an interesting thing as a collective to go through all of these changes. And, and then they're basically being forced into it because that was not one of their core values to start. Right. Well, and so you know, what are the they supposed thing, to do? Yeah. yeah it, the, and the other thing about this is along with the automated um, processes comes no cash, right? That was one of the big things. It's going to be a cashless is how they're testing it anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that has become more and more frequent. I remember going into places and they're like, sorry, it's cash only. And I'm like, oh man, all I have is a debit card. And now it's the opposite where it's like, mm-hmm. listen, if you don't have a debit card, we can't take cash. And I'm like, well, what the heck? So it's very interesting. And I, you know, I hope that Chipotle will remain nimble so that as things kind of tilt back the other way, they can um, pivot yet again if they need to. Um, but this will certainly be interesting. And so if you happen to be in one of those markets where they're testing it out, don't be shocked. Make sure you carry your debit card or that you have your app on your phone because who knows, it might be you know Google or Apple Pay or Chipotle app only, um, which my son will be happy with. You know, you get extra points for using their <laughs> app. Free burritos, you know? So Well, and, and here's the thing. If you've had an experience um, where you've been through automated QSR service or if you are in that industry, and you want to call in and, and give us your opinion on this, our number is 323-580-5755. So give us a call. We'd love to hear your two cents. Awesome. Thank you. Does this mean it's time to go to see our guest? Let's do it. <gasps> it does. It does. All right, folks. Let's go. Hey, hey. Hey. We got a great guest today. Welcome we to the show, Jeff uh, Schoenberg. Hello. And uh, Jeff has been in the franchise development executive for the past 20 years, and he's owned his own franchise for the past 11. And he assists individuals in the decision making process with franchising is the correct way for them to follow. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate nice it. Nice to see you again. Yes. Yes, Kristen. Thank you. Let's talk all about your brand today. Yeah, you got it. Supporting strategies um, is. Do you want me just to start uh, from the top, yes. or? Yeah, tell us what you what your brand does to support. In particular, you're supporting primarily small business franchise businesses, or just small business in general. Small businesses in general, small to mid size. So supporting okay. strategies. The, the, our franchisees provide outsourced bookkeeping, accounting services. You know, you could say CFO fractional type of services to small and mid-sized businesses and small to mid-sized. What does that mean? Probably a range from on the low end, a million dollars in revenue to as high as maybe $20 million in revenue. But we do have franchisees that work with companies bigger than $20 million. Uh, but, but any company can be a, a potential client, whether it's a franchise or independently owned. Um, just just by just coincidentally, I was talking to one of our franchisees a couple of days ago. He was engaged with a QSR franchise owner who had seven locations, and he was they were looking to use supporting strategies to be to outsource all their accounting to him. Um, 
So it could be any, and that's the that's the beauty of this business. The the marketplace is wide open. There's you know, any any business is a potential client. Sure. And how did you get into um, providing these services? I mean, obviously, I know as a small as a small business as a franchisee, you know, the one thing I hate is accounting, right? Like sure. that's my nemesis. Sure. Um, so for me, it sounds great. But how did you come about this? this well, I, I don't. I can't take credit for it, obviously. Uh, Leslie Jorgensen, who's our CEO and founder, she was a uh, finance accounting professional. Uh, this is in Boston back in 2004. She okay. saw that outsourced accounting bookkeeping was taking shape, partly due to, um, as we're talking about automation and talking about technology, that's a big, you know, that's a big part of what we do it because of um, how much technology comes into, the, into play. She saw back in 2004, things were really starting to take shape so she hung, she left her job. She didn't buy a franchise. She started her business on her own, uh, hung her shingle. And in 10 years, she built up a, a good sized business uh, that allowed her, and I don't know the exact storyline, but she mm -hmm. launched the franchise in 2014. And now nine years later, there's, uh, we should be at 80 locations uh, as of next month with somebody signing on next month. Awesome, that's uh, great. Before we get, too deep into the franchise part of this, maybe some of our audience want to know the difference between bookkeeping, accounting, and maybe tax accounting. Yep, good question. And and we don't do any, our franchisees don't get involved at all in taxes. So we don't do anything tax related. But mm -hmm. bookkeeping, accounting, it, it's sort of, inter they, they're sort of used interchangeably. It, it's really just whatever the client needs in terms of outsourcing their accounting functions, whatever that may be. So, you know, obviously bookkeeping doesn't apply probably to a $20 million company uh, or a client, uh, but it's just, it's, it's the, it's the world we play in. And those are the, the, the word, you know, those are the terms that we use in terms of the description. So, I mean, is there a difference between accounting and bookkeeping services? Probably not. It's just, that's, that's how we define ourselves. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And so um, right now, what would you describe as somebody, you don't necessarily to be a franchisee, I don't necessarily need to be a CPA to buy Correct. a franchise, you, you, right? Not at all. No. So so the ideal franchise, so when the business was started, ideally we were uh, approaching or they were approaching um, CPAs, accountants, et cetera, um, which, which still makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But what has evolved over time and what really separates our top performers uh, from you know, middle performers is the individual that has a strong business acumen, but also experience with uh, uh, networking, business development, leading and managing a team. Mm -hmm. and, and, the reason, and the reason why that's all important is that when they start to scale and add clients, we will, and we, act, we have a talent acquisition department, so we do help our franchisees staff their their businesses they're not required to use us but i don't think we have anybody that doesn't use us but when right. they start to scale we actually will go out and identify qualify interview and present to our franchisees in terms of what they're looking for like a recruiter would we'll give them a slate of candidates to interview so we handle all that for our franchisees so those are the those are the accounting professionals and doesn't mean that the franchisee isn't a professional leader but just again just as an example we have a franchisee came out of the military, got into consulting, left consulting, and then opened up our franchise, is doing extraordinarily well. He's not a CPA, he's not a, an accountant, but you know, really strong business acumen, understands business development, understands providing a consultative approach to when he's talking to a client. Um, and he has a staff of accounting professionals that we help, you know, help, help him find. Okay. Yep. Now, would you say that, um... Is this a is this a business that somebody who maybe wants to be more of an absentee owner? Um, is, does this lend itself well to it, that? To that? Well, it doesn't. It, it doesn't at first, um, but it you know down the road, three four years into it, if, if a franchisee wanted to maybe step back from that wearing that business development hat, because that's what we want mm -hmm. our franchisees to be doing, yep. the, the staff that they're gonna that we're gonna help them hire, they're gonna do the work. We don't want our franchisee franchisee to be the practitioner. Right. Um, so, with that said, maybe down the road, and again, it, it, you know, down the road can mean two years, four years, whatever. Um, they would then hire a business development person, either okay. either 
uh, part time or full time, uh, which which would, you know, which would sort of create that semi absentee uh, uh, position. But they probably still would be involved with when that business development person lands a client or gets, a, you know, is talking to a client, then the franchisee steps in. But it frees them up, obviously, without having to, to do that. And it sounds like a lot of these now. Do you do you require them to have um, a, a brick and mortar and office yeah, that was somewhere? Right. <laughs> no, that's the beauty of our business. Very low overhead, extremely low overhead. We're hundred percent remote and we were remote before COVID. So this isn't a pivot or anything like that. All of our franchisees work out of their homes. All of their staff work out of their homes. Um, it's, there's no brick, there's no very low overhead. There's no car or van to get to wrap. There's no inventory. There's no signage. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a very low overhead business with, with a high margin. Our franchisees, uh, on average, are experiencing a 40% gross profit margin, and that wow. includes, yeah. and that's in our FDD, and that includes uh, the 10% royalty and that office's labor cost. So the so the other oh, the rest of the overhead, and and you know this may sound silly, but internet, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know minor things, um, their nets aren't far from the 40%. Nice. So, not only can you start this business from your home, but you can continue to develop it pretty high without even leaving your home. Exactly. Other than, other than you know, our, our client acquisition strategy is based on, on, on building a referral network that we call evangelist network. So within your specific territory, within the franchisee specific territory, on a weekly basis, you know, they might be going to a couple networking events meeting with account or with, yeah, with accountants, CPAs, attorneys, anybody who, who works with businesses that can be a referral source. And that we always joke that the franchisees advertising cost is a cup of coffee because they're not they're not <laughs> spending money on, on advertising. They're just they're meeting people and telling them what they do. And then right. with the snowball effect, they start to get referrals from that. Um, we do. They each have a website. Uh, we manage that website for them. It's search engine optimized. There's digital marketing that we'll do for them. But the majority of the client uh, that they acquire is through this uh, business, this referral network that they build. Wow. And, then, and then as they scale and get clients, clients become referral sources. So That's I've, got, awesome. I've got a couple questions for you. Uh, sure. What are the top three things you're looking for in the FDD for a potential owner? And then, yeah, let's go, let's go with that first and then we'll. So the, the top three things that we're looking for in the FDD uh, the top three things that you're looking for in a potential buyer of your franchise. Uh, sure. So, so it would be what we were just discussing that, that strong business acumen, obviously, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but that strong business acumen, either a track record of, or they, or they're comfortable with business development, ideally some type of track record. Uh, it doesn't mean they have to be a salesperson or they've got cold call, Sailing a cold call sales experience because none of our franchisees cold call or knock on doors or canvas buildings, but they have some type of business development. And then I guess to to, to take it one more degree, if, if it's if it, if it is a track record of that in their actual community, that's even better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, management skills that they've led a team that they've managed people it doesn't have to be 20, 30, but they've had some experience that way. Those would be the top three things: business acumen business development experience and management experience. And how, and, how and of course, and of course, you know, there's, there, there's, there's a lot of open, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're not rigid in exactly who we're going to look at. Um, but, but just in general, those would be the three areas. And, and what type of uh, investment uh, would a potential uh, candidate lo be looking at? Yep. So our FDD, uh, the low end startup to the high end is 77,000 to 103,000. Now that includes the one-time franchise fee of sixty thousand dollars, one-time franchise fee, and it includes a recommended or suggested on the low end ten thousand working capital to thirty thousand working capital. So if you back out the working capital on the low end, the seventy-seven thousand, and you back out the sixty, you know you're looking at another, you know what is it, um, ten, thirteen thousand or so in startup costs, and then mm -hmm. on the on the high end you're looking at uh, like 77,000 in, in true startup costs, which includes the franchise fee. So um, it, it's it's very low compared to other businesses. I'm not saying that this this, this is not, you know, this is cheap, but it's compared right. to other businesses, very low. 
Jeff, would you say this is a, a I mean, to me, I, I envision this as something that someone could start even while they're um, either wrapping up a professional career, um, you know, kind of as a transition, you know, they know they want to start something on their own, but right. they kind of start this as they ease out of their professional career. So they keep a lot of the connections they have and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So, so the connections are important, obviously. Uh, and, and the connections don't have to necessarily be in their territory. Like, like we all have, uh, you know, LinkedIn uh, connections and things like that. So we'll we'll capitalize on that as well once they join us to make an outreach to those individuals to make them aware of what the franchise is doing. In, in terms of the, what you're suggesting, Kristen, um, I mean, ideally we want them to be hundred. We want this to be their full focus. So again, you know, we're we're open to discussion if somebody for whatever reason uh, is, is going to wants to join us, we put everything together and, but they still want to, they got a three month assignment or something. That's mm -hmm. fine. But we, we don't like to paint it as semi absentee or anything like that. We do want them to be, this is their job. This is their focus. Cause it'd be okay. a disservice to them if we, if we didn't, um, you know, paint it that way, because that's, you're not going to be successful doing it part-time. Sure. One of the, one of the final questions that I have about this is obviously this is not, um, a clear-cut territory type thing. How, well, how it is and it isn't. It, it, it okay. is and it isn't. They do get a territory. So okay. every franchisee has a geographical footprint uh -huh. and our territories are created, uh, the, the base, the way we create them is that every territory has a minimum of 20,000 businesses in it with an employee count of 100 or less. So the criteria that we use is employee count, not industry. So it can be any industry, any huh. type of business, but employee count. So they do get a geographical footprint uh, okay. 20,000 or more businesses. But again, the, the client acquisition, the, the client follows the referral source. So a franchisee that's in whatever Atlanta in their mm -hmm. market and they're meeting with somebody or they've met somebody and that person calls them up a day later, a week later and says, hey, I've got this great client. They really need to talk to you. They're interested and they're in Los Angeles. They can work with them because okay. they were referred to them. The one right. thing our franchisees can't do is they, if they do any advertising, they can't do it outside of their territory. Okay. And they can't join business networking groups, chamber of commerces, things like that outside of their territory. I see. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. We've got a couple of um, folks we work with who are in national um, networking groups. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she would just do amazing at this. So that kind of answers that question. So. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Wow. How does somebody get a hold of you, Jeff, if they want to talk to you further about this opportunity? Well, my, my phone number is 215-285-8108. Okay. My email address is my first initial J, last name Schoenberg, S-C-H-O-N-B-E-R-G at supportingstrategies.com. Or they can go to the website, supporting supportingstrategiesfranchise.com. Okay. And my information is that you know is on on the bottom of that page as well. Awesome. And all this information will be on our web page. <laughs> so okay. in case you didn't have it, if you're driving, you didn't have a chance to write this all down, it will be right. there. Yeah, there Jeff. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to have you on the show today, sharing more information about your business and the franchise opportunities that you have. And uh, again, I'm sure Jeff will hang around for a few minutes if anybody has questions at three two three. 580-5755. And again, Jeff, we'll look forward to catching up with you again in the very near future. And um, thanks again for being on the show today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And, and thanks for what you do for franchising. Awesome. You Thank thanks, you. Jeff. You're welcome. Hey, franchise owners. How is your local marketing? Do you feel like you could use help keeping up with your social media posts and comments and reviews? Do you wonder if you could be doing more to attract local customers? Are you able to identify new movements to your local area? At Westvine, we help franchisees like you reach more local customers through digital marketing. With daily monitoring, creative content, and ad placement, and customer data intelligence, we'll get your business in front of the people who want your products or services. We also work with franchisors who need an agency to handle the digital marketing for all of their locations. If you're ready to reach more local customers, give us a call at 805-265-5440 or visit us at westvine.com. That's 805-265-5440 or westvine with a y.com. 
<laughs> Yay, Jerry! Well, good afternoon. How are you, Kristen? I am doing great. How are you? Well, Kristen, I'm great, but I got a couple problems today. I mean, if you'll notice my fake background, everybody's got fake backgrounds today. <laughs> my fake background is uh, is resort chic. That's what I call it, <laughs> resort chic. See that beautiful photo back there on the wall? And, uh, yeah. and my, my glasses are a little darker than I like because I've got a little problem with lighting today because <laughs> I'm on the fifth floor of a resort hotel in Naples, Florida, looking at the ocean and palm trees. Uh, yeah, just rub it in, Jerry. Rub <laughs> it in. You know, we got to go as a franchisee. You got to go to those educational events whenever you can, and that's what we've got going on uh, this week. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, it sucks when they're in the middle of winter in a beautiful place, doesn't it? I'm feeling sorry for everybody here. I'm trying to live and live it up enough so y'all can feel it from wherever you're at. Okay. Right. Okay. Good. All right. Well, let's just move right along. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to continue talking about the chapters of the book because we want our listeners to, you know, get at least a, a taste, a little flavor for all the pieces that go into considering being a franchisee and the exploration of that and deciding if it's for them. And then if they do, the things that they need to put in place as they move forward. And today, uh, the chapter we're going to be talking about is meeting your new business partners. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Kristen, you know it as well as I do, most people thinking about becoming a franchisee and doing it on their own may not think they have business partners, but you mm -hmm. and I know they do because their franchisor is definitely a partner in the business with them. Exactly. So this doesn't necessarily mean the person that you are um, borrowing money from. Yep, absolutely not. But you know, what everybody needs to understand is franchisors, one of their jobs is to protect the brand. And they do right. that for themselves, but they also do it for all the other franchisees that bought into it. So when you're going through that exploration process, you've got to understand it's a dating game. And yes. you may go into it thinking that you have all the control, but in reality, it's a two-way street and they can decide whether you're a good fit for them the same as you're deciding about, about them. So uh -huh. we want to talk about that a little bit. You know. Um, again many people don't understand that you know the franchisee and the franchise or a relationship is interdependent yeah and it's yep. you're mutually accountable right you got to be accountable to both sides that's right it's like a marriage it absolutely is and before we go much further with that remember 50 percent of the marriages end up not marriages and we don't want that to happen uh that's in right. the franchise model and That's since right. uh, Laura has started coming on, I'm a little apprehensive talking about legal things, so I'll leave that to her. <laughs> but uh, but I thought you were it, it say is a critical that, about talking about marriages, and I was like, really? <laughs> well, we can do that offline sometime too. But no, um, you need to understand when you buy uh, when you buy a franchise, you're setting up an independent business, but right. it's also interdependent on. The franchise or and, and people need to understand that because uh and i face this as a business coach every day talking to franchisees who are mad at the franchisor for not doing certain things fill in the blank and many of them forget that if you go all the way back to the fdd and the discovery process and those kinds of things it was very clear how uh, you know where the dividing lines were who was going to do what what was what was not and in the era of joint employer, which we've talked about before and we can revisit again, franchisors are further and further distancing themselves from anything to do with human resources and hiring and people issues. And yes. in an era when staffing is an issue for almost everybody, that's the first thing right now that franchisees are complaining about that franchisors mm -hmm. are not doing, but in reality, it's really not their job. So um, yes. we, you need to understand and I want to talk through the path of that relationship path just a little bit. And and okay. this is another this is another chapter, Kristen, that um, I can't do it justice in a few minutes. There's there's unbelievable amounts of information in it, but I'll try and hit some highlights. Sure. Um, people are a part of that path, and I'll tell you that when we first uh, got into franchising, you know, and we started talking to the people at corporate, uh, many of them. 17 years later are still really dear friends of us we wouldn't be mm -hmm. where we're at today if it weren't for them but that's because we created a relationship with them it wasn't just business it was uh, about them as well as it was about us so sure. uh, i would suggest 
you know, what you're going to have or the process is you're going to talk to a business broker. Many people start with a business broker who introduces mm -hmm. them to maybe several concepts and you sort through that with the broker. Uh, right. You probably will get introduced to a franchise development people from a person from corporate who yep. will take you along that path. They likely will f facilitate Discovery Day. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, it's been in person where you would go to corporate and meet the VPs of several departments. They do a 15 to 30 minute presentation so you can ask questions and so on. Uh, many of them are virtual now, but the same thing happens. But what we did a little different than a lot of people do in there in that case, we wanted to know about those people as well as the business. We wanted yes. to know what got them up in the morning, why they were excited about the franchise or why they worked there. Uh, what were the successes they'd seen and the best practices that went into those. And by asking those kinds of questions, you really quickly create a relationship. And one of the things I want everybody to understand this listening, franchisors are looking for future rock star franchisees. Absolutely. They, they may have dozens of people talking to them on a regular basis and they're trying to sift through all that sand and find that diamond in the rough. And when right. you engage with them at a different level, it puts you at a different level, not only then, but moving forward into the future. Right. And, and, and it does sound, it sounds cliche, but it really is. We're all in it together, right? Because your success is their success and their success is your success. I mean, it really does go hand in hand because you're all wearing the same brand. Well, yes. And, you know, most franchisors really look at you as, as a human being and a part of their team, and they really want to help you and your family. But at the yep. end of the tunnel, right, at the end of that road, they still get a piece of every revenue dollar that goes through every location you've got. Yep. And if they've got four people that want the same location, the same license, they're likely going to try and pick the one that offers the best return on investment for them. So we've yep. got to understand creating that relationship puts you in a different position with them when they're trying to decide who gets it and who doesn't. And so go beyond the norm. And we all know that, you know, your skill level and your determination, your commitment and those kinds of things weigh very heavily in the process about not only if you're successful, but if you get chosen to be a franchisee, um, but it still comes down to people. And those franchisors and the development people are looking at you and thinking about what it's going to be like to work with you for 20 years or 30 right. years. And they want to make sure it's a good fit for everybody. So um, this is this is pretty critical. Um, yep. So you're going to you're going to have the broker. You're going to have the development rep. You're going to be talking to. You're going to go through the uh, discovery day and then everybody's going to move from there and you're going to have some further discussions. Now, one of the things that we did in the book that I really want people to concentrate on and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But uh, because we don't have a lot of time today, but we can certainly get into it further. One of the hints I would give people is really play the part of the newbie. Don't come into those discovery days and conversations with franchisors as if you first off know everything and second off think you can create a better mousetrap than what they've created. For sure. Nothing offends a franchisor more than you calling their baby ugly. <laughs> <laughs> because they spent a lot of time and effort and money developing that. They found a certain level of success. And to them, you really are a newbie. You don't really know what you're talking about. So I coach people right. before they go to those. If they have a, have, a, have a master's degree in marketing, forget it. Yes. Pretend you don't know anything about marketing. Let them present to you their marketing strategy because yep. it's, been, it's been to the fire. It's been through the war. They know what works and what doesn't. And many of the things that they're going to talk about, maybe like guerrilla marketing things or something like that, that virtually are never talked about in college business marketing classes. So yeah. you got to understand they know it. You're paying for it. Take advantage of it. Yep. Be humble. So we give a list of questions. I, I suggest to everybody when they're going to a discovery day, be prepared. Know who you're going to be talking to, which departments are going to be there. You can ask. And they'll tell you, they'll introduce you. You'll probably get an agenda before you go listing uh, the name of the person and the department they represent. So create a list of questions. And we conveniently put a lot of questions about a lot of different subjects from different departments in the book that you can steal. We call it market mm -hmm. research, not stealing. Mm -hmm. So you can use it. <laughs> but the bottom line is you want to dig into it. You want to show that you've done your research. You understand at least enough to ask educated questions. And you really want to know where you fit into that because 
what are they going to do? What do they offer and where do you take over? And then when you take over, you're still gonna need support. So who do you make a phone call to? Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot, I won't spend a lot of time going through it, but right now I can tell you in this short piece, we've got uh, questions to ask the real estate vice president. Where do I locate? What do I look for? What do anchors look like? What are demographics? What are traffic counts? Some of those kinds of things. In the facility side, what kind of what kind of spaces are we looking for? You know, how do we build them out? Who's my main contact when I run into trouble on those kinds of things? For recruiting and training, we already talked about the fact that's not their job, but they that's will right. be able to give you leads, maybe to third party vendors that they've uh -huh. vetted that will help with that or different avenues that you can pursue to find those people. Uh, marketing, of course, will be huge and they'll have a VP of marketing that can talk to you about what works in their brand that's different than everybody else. And then of course, operations. So understand there's a process. This is, in my opinion, one of the most critical chapters in making that decision about the right one because the people you're gonna be married to for some yeah. period of time. So you gotta make sure it's a good fit and you gotta get your questions answered. Excellent, Jerry. So let me recap what I've written down because you know I'm a, I'm a crazy note writer. So I've got in this chapter the highlights. And again, spend time in this chapter, get out your highlighters, get out your page flags. This is the chapter that will teach you about building lifelong relationships. Don't think that just because you have money that franchisor is going to award you a franchise. It's deeper than that. It has to be a win-win situation for everybody. Don't walk in thinking that your experience or your degree is gonna win them over. You need to be humble. Be prepared at discovery day. Know who you're gonna meet with and start to build a resource list of who to go back to when you need help. Because inevitably, there will be times that you're gonna to need to pick up the phone and make a phone call or drop an email to somebody for some help. And again, remember to spend time in this chapter so that when you go, you are prepared. Put your best foot forward and remember again, you are interviewing for them just as much as they are interviewing for you. So this has got to be, uh, it really does have to be a marriage. And you know, I want to, I want to point out that, Love you know, I am radio. still the broker that helped me buy my business. Welcome we to Blog Talk Radio. Friends. Please hold I, I, and you will you know, be able I to listen to the show. We started doing pillars. I follow her on Facebook. But the development gentleman that I had at Molly Made is your CEO now at Great Clips. I'm muted. Rob Goggins, I mean, right. fantastic people. And those are, you know, the, the people that Ray and I had at Molly Maid are now at Lash Lounge and Franworth. And that's what we're talking about. It is a close knit community. So make those connections because they will follow you through franchising. So I think that's great, Jerry. And, and I did get through this chapter. I really enjoyed it. And I really hope people take time with the book. And I, I can't emphasize enough highlighters and page flags. I'll Living tell you to what. own it. This, I don't care if you buy it or not. I, I literally, you don't make a lot of money on books. I'm just going to be upfront with everybody. But the fact is, the information in here, even in just one chapter, will save you tons of money, immense amounts of headache, and lots of time. So consider it. Uh, I'll tell you a really quick story to close this out, but I have actually been at a discovery day with somebody who is brilliant, literally world-class, works with some of the biggest companies in the world, and he went into that thinking he was going to change the processes the franchisor had and make them better, which in effect said their baby was ugly. He did not, even though he had money and experience and all kinds of cool things, did not get accepted as a franchisee. So word to yes. the wise. Yeah. Kristen, always a pleasure. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh-oh. You, you don't get here. out of it that easy, dude. I have two questions today. Oh. Uh -oh. All right. Give me the easy one first. No, going to give you the hard one first. You'll understand why in a minute. So I was having a discussion with a potential mentee and I got into an argument with them. And you're going to say, go figure. I know it's right. kind of a given. They were, uh, they've been torn between starting their own business and buying a franchise. And their thing was, I really don't buy a franchise. I buy a um I buy or I lease a franchise. So, how is it different between leasing it and buying it? What well, would that, you say that's to a them? great question. You know, and, and that person just has a different take on it. In effect, you buy a license for a period of time when you buy a franchise. 
5, 10, 20 years, depending on what the franchise or lays out. So if you want to look at it from that standpoint, sure, you're leasing it and they could always, you know, re not renew your license at the end of that period of time. But I will tell you this, franchisors will not do that because you mm -hmm. are the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You're going to continue to send them royalty money all the time. So if you're successful, you're going to, you're, they're going to keep you forever. They're going to actually uh, renew ahead of time to keep you involved. Yep. They're going to go overboard to make sure you have opportunities. And you do not get that when you go into business for yourself, by yourself. So I understand what they're saying. I disagree with it wholeheartedly. I believe, as we talk about in this show all the time, that uh, having the peer group support that you have with franchising is worth whatever you got to pay. And that's beyond the support that you get from the franchise or themselves. So great question. Yep. We disagree. I would not get in an argument because you don't win those, Fred, but I would change their mind. I just enjoy arguing. So now for the second question. It's the easy one, and you'll know why. Rumor has it that you are going to be in San Diego at the end of this month at the IFA convention. So the question is, is A, it's a two-parter, will you have books there for sale? And B, will you be charging for autographs? <laughs> the question to A is yes. We will have books there for sale. We will have a uh, book signing table where people can come in and we can talk about what's in the book and, and give them some guidance and, and sign them and all those kinds of things. So yes, I'll be there. I'll be very engaged at IFA this year, partially because the book came up uh, out. So um, I'll be there. I'll be happy to talk to anybody that shows up to, to catch up with me. And the last question, which you didn't bring up, is this a good time to buy a franchise? And guys, you're not gonna get me to change my answer on this. People are leaving corporate America. They're looking for a difference in their lives. They're looking to take control of their lives and to live a better life. And franchising is the number one way to do that. Uh, but you do need help to make it to the top. So yes, do it. I would say do it sooner rather than later. And you've yeah. got mentors on this show or mentors close to you, find some help. Signing awesome. off for this week, folks. Thank you, Jerry. Laura, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Welcome again to for uh, to excuse me to Laura List. Laura is our legal uh, advisor on the show again this week. And Laura, I understand today we're going to be talking about marketing re requirements in that big fat franchise disclosure document. Absolutely. So. You know, there's a few different types of marketing, right? A few different times yep. that franchisees are thinking about, you know, they need to be, they need to be thinking about uh, sure. what they are going to put forward in their business. Um, and I think, you know, I tell every franchisee this, you know, when I when I do my review meetings, when I review FDDs for clients, okay, um, the last thing I put on my review checklist, okay, every time, because I, I it, we talk about everything. We talk about the whole FDD, we talk about their business, their financing, Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's all about marketing, right? That's how they're going to grow, right? That's how the business grows. That's how the brand grows. That's how consumer awareness grows. And yep. that in turn means your business grows. That's right. So, you know, to me, you have to, as a franchisee, absolutely love their marketing, at least when you buy, right? You know, mm -hmm. marketing can change, right? They can come up with new splashy things. Um, but you have to love their brand and you have to love their, you know, what in the industry we would call marketing collateral, right? You have nice. to, however, they're giving you pieces to use. Okay. So whether that, yeah. uh, you know, what should I put on my, you know, Facebook ad or sure. you know, I have a billboard, um, you know, all of these things, right? The, one of the things that you pay for typically through what's known as an ad fund or a brand fund or a marketing fund um, is that you as a franchisee are contributing one, two, three, sometimes more percent mm -hmm. um, of your gross sales. Okay, right. so it's, it's not a small amount towards right. the franchisor having a budget to be able to create this marketing. And when there are other franchisees in the franchise system, assuming you're buying into a system where there's, you know, power and numbers, right. um, the franchisor is able to pool all of right. that. Okay. 
And so they are able to actually create some really, you know, hopefully decent marketing collateral for you to use. Um, Can we, um, I want to, I want to clarify for people who may not be familiar with how we use the word um, collateral. And in this sense, collateral would be, for example, um, print examples. So for example, in my brand, collateral would be the artwork for logos on the car. Collateral would be the artwork for postcards or the artwork for social media pages. So when we reference collateral, that's what we mean. It means you don't have to go out and make the videos. You don't have to go out and design the logos that collateral is done for you. Absolutely. And I would even take that a step further. Okay. I would say that the collateral, it includes things like a handout, right? Yeah. You know, back yes. in the day when we all used to actually see each other, um, yeah. you know, you actually saw your customers, right? You know, in your business, That's maybe right. they would make um, a nice, like a door hanger, right? That's right. Yep. You know, something that could actually be put out physically. Uh, you yep. know, if somebody has questions, right? You know, like an FAQ, um, mm -hmm. those things. Because ultimately, the franchisor wants all of that to look really smooth. They want it to reflect the brand well. Right. Um, you know, they they don't want uh, <laughs> you know sort of junky looking, you know, homemade right. whatever. You know, and sometimes that can look sure. cute, but more often than not, it looks a little you know questionable. Right. Um, and when you're yeah. building a brand, you need consistency, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so, and part of that is making sure that if, you know, you have, let's just say logo cars, you want your logo car to look the same as your neighbor's logo car and yeah. that neighbor's logo car. Right. And so that's, that's kind of the, the idea of building a brand. For sure. That's why you buy a franchise. That's right? why that's, that's a brand. big part. That's why I tell my franchisee clients, you have to love this brand, you know, and the brand can mean a lot of things, but in sure. this, this discussion, it means they're marketing. OK, yep. um, so we have that first, you know, type of marketing, which is a percentage of top line sales. Right. You know, and that's going to the, the brand fund, the ad fund, whatever it's called in that particular franchise system. OK, and that's pooled. Um, typically, the franchisor will have no obligation to spend it in, you know, your particular territory. Um, you know, it can also be used to, for example, pay for salaries for people who do that work, who are on staff in house. Okay. okay. Sometimes franchisees don't like that. They think that, well, you know, if that's their salary, the franchisor should pay that. But in reality, oftentimes it would cost more for them to outsource it, you know, to a, a marketing firm mm -hmm. to get the same amount of work product. And so there's really no way around the cost um, for, you know, and the nobody would dispute if they said, oh, well, you know, the fund paid for this marketing firm to develop this collateral. Right. Everybody would accept that. Uh, so really where the industry is, is that those type of administrative expenses um, are, are common. Okay. Okay. Uh, then, you know, we think about, okay, what comes, you know, what happens when I'm going to first open? Um, and I know we have another speaker coming up who's going to talk a little bit uh, about their grand opening, right? Mm -hmm. And not coming yet, but they're starting to have to think about how do I get ready? How do I tell the public? that I'm coming, basically. Right. Like, here, you should get excited, like I'm excited. Uh -huh. uh, and to do that, we call, you know, we think of that as our grand opening advertising uh, budget. And uh -huh. every franchise pretty much has a minimum required amount and usually a marketing plan for that grand uh -huh. opening, okay? Um, and that's really beneficial. I encourage clients to, really dig in before they sign, you know, before they sign the contract to say, sure. okay, what are we doing with this 10,000, 20,000, $30,000? You know, where is it going? How are we spending it? You know, am I doing internet, you know, am I doing ads on Facebook? Am I doing, you know, door hangers? Am I doing, you know, mailers, whatever it is. Um, again, you know, I would echo what Jerry said that if you have a background in market marketing, <laughs> um, Please, you know, I would encourage you not to wear that hat when you look at it. It will be really hard to take it off, uh, but you, it's something that they are experiencing every single day. Okay. Yep. Maybe you do have a great idea that they should consider, um, but try not to shut them down and call their baby ugly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, while you share, you know, your wisdom. Um, sure. 
it's it is very uh you know questionable if you're really committed to the brand if you're saying you don't like anything about the brand laura are these marketing amounts are these usually something that you can negotiate in your contract or are these pretty steadfast i would say that these tend to be pretty fixed um okay. and the reasoning there you know and there are other things that i do help clients negotiate and so i'm i get this question a lot you know is this negotiable is that negotiable yep. um you know, and some of that I would say varies by the size of the franchise brand. But in, okay. in this case, for the marketing fees, I would say they're they not they're not something that we typically negotiate. Okay. okay. Um, and the reasoning for that, you know, if we think about the grand opening, especially, you want a really good grand opening. Sure. It's yeah. tough to recover if you don't have that, frankly. Okay. Uh, it's tough to get that momentum back, right? Um, and when we say grand opening, we're not just talking about the day up because you're like, how could I spend ten thousand dollars on the day, right? Yeah, yeah. Dollars on the day, like, right. you know, without just basically burning money, right? How could I spend that on the day? Sure. Um, in, in the industry, that is really considered typically the thirty to sixty days before the day, okay, and then thirty to even ninety days after the day. Okay, so, so you it's, build anticipation. It's to build anticipation. It's to re, do repeat reminders to you know either customers or potential customers that okay. you're still there, that they should still want to go you know get a smoothie or right. have their house cleaned or get their hair cut or whatever it is that you're offering. Okay, um, and and that kind of you know consumer penetration, if you will. Uh -huh really important you know it, it on average I, i've heard multiple sources say it takes roughly you know 13 touch points uh -huh. before someone really remembers and decides to buy and maybe that's find... it's a smaller purchase but if it's something you know more expensive uh, that will take that now i've heard of franchisors requiring people to use very specific marketing vendors and okay. some don't do you find uh, one to be more, uh, we'll use advantageous, cumbersome, evan what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Cons of, of each approach. And there are pros and cons of each approach. Um, yeah. When it is a mandatory marketing vendor, usually that means that it's a very streamlined plan. So that's a pro, right? Um, because otherwise, if you didn't have someone like that, you know, and they said, okay, well, you need to spend, you know, $10,000 on social media advertising. And maybe they mm -hmm. would give you, you know, the stock images and they would give you the stock text to use and that kind of thing. But they wouldn't necessarily tell you how to place it or, right. you know, that is a big detriment if they don't do that. That's a problem because you don't know how to place it. I mean, I know just enough about Google ads to be dangerous, but I sure. thought hey, you're, you're an expert. Um, yes. And most most franchisees are never going to be an expert. Uh, you know, that's somebody else's job, right? Right. So it, usually it is advantageous to have a, at least a preferred vendor. Um, sure. Sometimes maybe there will be a mandatory, a designated vendor, but preferred is usually normal. Um, and sometimes the franchisor will even say for grand opening in particular, you know, you pay that to us and we will okay. go out and spend it on your behalf. Okay, interesting, very good. Okay, great. Anything that we should be watching for when signing an FDD that is a red flag in the marketing? In the marketing section. Um, I think that you know they need to have that comprehensive plan that they can speak to about how are you gonna spend this and how do they spend it? Like, what are they doing with the money that you pay them? Uh -huh. Right? They should be giving you samples, you know, or showing you what other franchisees are doing. Um, okay. I think that, you know, if you are uncomfortable with, you know, a high administrative cost, like many franchisees yep. are, um, that is very clearly spelled out. So you can, or I can check for that in the FDD. And that may be a red flag, you know, depending on your comfort level. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. We look forward next week to some more legal tips as we break down the um, FDD process, reviewing that, and more franchising fun facts as it pertains to the legal issues. Thank you. Excellent. Laura List, thank you again. All right, jam-packed show so far and more to come. First, I want to remind everyone how to buy Jerry's book. Um, 
The website is liveit2ownit.com. That is liveit number two, ownit.com. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for the show and the magazine, the Titus Center for Franchising. The Titus Center for Franchising is the only dedicated university center in the country focused on enabling students to master the principles of business franchising. Um, to visit them, you go to pba.edu and look for Titus Center for Franchising. We're also welcoming the franchise show 247.com as a sponsor. They are a 24 seven exhibition platform. Pillars of Franchising has a virtual booth there. If you'd like to check us out and uh, see what they are all about, go to franchise show 247.com. Up next, we have David Kajanik. Hey, David. Hey, Chris. And How's it going? So good, back after two weeks, right? So yeah, I'm continuing welcome. this. Yeah, thank you. Continuing this journey of hurry up and wait. Right? <laughs> so this is a this is a good theme for uh, for all prospective franchisees to know that this is this is real life. That's why we're doing this segment, right? Yeah. So it really hasn't changed in the from the very first time I did this 28 years ago to, to now. Um, <laughs> I can temper it a little bit better, I think is the biggest yeah. difference. I, yeah. I can temper it where back then it was my first business. What's taking so long? Let's go build the uh -huh. place out, you know, all those things. And now it's, yeah, we'll get to it. We're going to open. There's nothing to stress out about. It's going to get there. Right. Um, so, but it is still hurry up and wait. So it's, you know, it's, it's hard to give an update every, <clears throat> excuse me, every single week or every even couple weeks because you could say, wow, a lot happened and really nothing happened. So over the last right. couple of weeks, you know, we found a contractor. They've applied for permits. Um, hopefully they get them soon so they can get started. We've ordered some of the equipment, you know, and nervous about a lot of other equipment because of current delays of some things. So hopefully those sure. things will come in. Um, you know, we've had some ups and downs with some potential um, hires, you know, some we thought we had then backed out, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all things that are normal. So what do we do now? Well, right now it's the same thing. So the contract is in motion. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've got uh, ads running for hiring. So the next thing is something Laura had alluded to um, previously, and we're in, okay, let's, let's plan the marketing, right? Yep. And um, so similar to what Jerry's outstanding segment was, you start pe pulling together all these people that you know now are going to be the people who are going to help you build your business. Yeah. So, you know, it's the it's the corporate marketing manager, it's it's the outside marketing services team. It's getting in touch with the landlord right now to say, "Hey, what am I allowed to do? What will you allow me allow me to do around the building?" So, those are the things we're doing now and we're hiring them and hiring, ordering all the materials that go up on the building those types of things. And I want to echo what, what Laura had mentioned earlier is I take this approach to, to advertising slash marketing and I encourage other franchisees or prospective franchisees to, to do the same. Don't look at the FDD and look at that number and go, oh my gosh, I got to spend this money. And I used to sell this to all, when I was selling franchises 15 years ago, people, I'm like, were you planning on keeping it a secret? <laughs> Was Good that point. your goal? Was you were going to open the business but not tell anybody about it? Was that really yeah. the plan? Yeah. So I always tell me, even now, I have a budget. I have a required budget, as, as Laura alluded to, in, in the FED. I won't even come close to meeting. I'm going to, I'll go way beyond that. Right. Because if we get off on the wrong star, wrong foot, it's, it, as she said, it's going to take a long time to recover. So right. I go over and above that budget. That is an investment. Don't call, look at that as a cost. That's an investment in, in your business. And if you don't invest properly there, you're going to get off to a slow start. Now, everybody's business is different, right? We're brick yep. and mortar, so we need that. So our approach is going to be two different things. We're in a brand new market. You may, somebody may buy a franchise in an already ready-made market and may not need to do much branding. We That's have to right. brand like crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, if, so even though billboards or certain things might not be in that grand opening required package, I'm exploring them right now because I need to get the word out and scream from the mountaintops, we're yep. here and get used to that name. Then we'll take a more targeted approach um, to generate leads to get people to get trial and, 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 and come into the place. So two different approaches um, on the grand opening. And then I want to address one thing real quick is, is 
the other thing you have different strategies for different times right so it's grand opening but i'm going everybody's gonna look at fdd go i have to spend one percent or three percent or five percent and i have to do a co-op you know whatever that case may be and my feeling is this when it comes they talk about an advertising budget i'm one of the few will always say i don't have an advertising budget and everyone looks at me like i'm crazy and i tell everybody i says if you were to put one dollar in the bank and they guaranteed you you were going to get two dollars back how often yep. would you do that every single day all day long it's the same thing so it's two two approaches if i'm if i know i'm going to run an ad and it's going to cost me ten thousand dollars but i'm going to get the return i want on it i'm going to do that over and over and over and over again until the next point which is what i call the point of no return where it doesn't make sense now exactly. you know where you're stop now you can look at some different implements so that's just my thoughts on, on marketing and things that have worked grand openings different from ongoing um, this day and age is much different than it was 28 years ago and you have to be able to adapt and do what's best for your business sure sure i think the, the good point david that you really made that i want to point out to people is um because you are in a new market and it's a newer brand that absolutely justifies spending more in that marketplace because you're not coming out with a household brand. Yep. So um, good points with that, things to consider when you're out there shopping for a franchise. David, thank you so much for sharing um, once again your journey with us. We look forward to hearing from you again in a couple of weeks to see where you're at. And um, I, we really appreciate uh, your feedback and your honesty in your approach to marketing. You got it, anytime, take care. Awesome, thank you. All right, back one more time to wrap things up. Um, we are still looking for sponsors. If you would like to sponsor the magazine or the show or both, um, please send me an email at elizabeth at pillarsoffranchising.com. We've got some great opportunities to get the word out. Our exposure is growing every single day with the team of people that we keep um, growing. So be sure to take part in that. If you have not subscribed to the magazine, the February issue is out. It is on the website at pillarsoffranchising.com. Please go on and subscribe so that you get the email every time something new comes up. And we've got a lot of events coming up as well. Um, so make sure that you stay tuned to our email um, updates. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hey, Karen, how are you? Hello there, happy, happy February. Oh, I suppose it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That means we're getting closer to March. Sounds good. Yeah, so let's talk about, today we're going to talk about ideal player, team players. Right, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we were talking last time I was on, and we were, we were saying we're going to start highlighting a book a month. Yes. You mentioned ideal team players. So I thought it would take a couple of minutes and, and really just share a few highlights and share kind of why I like this and why I like this for franchisees. Um, awesome. As we all know, we're we're we talk about the the labor shortage. We talk about the labor crunch, and we try to make sure whoever we have on our teams that they're going to make we're going to make sure that they're team players. And you know, we talk about the ideal team team approach. So it's making sure that we're hiring and attracting those right people. Awesome. So there are really three key things that, um, you know, that Patrick Lencioni talks about in his book, The Ideal Team Player. And I, I love it because he talks about how, and he always takes it through the, you know, fables, right? He always talks, if there's a story to tell, and I don't know about you, but I just talk, I always think about how um, I'm in that story. You know, uh -huh. I, I'm in that story and I can see where the mistakes I've made and, and what's happened there. And it just, he just really brings you along. And he really talks about how you need to make sure that it's really people that are hungry that they're going to get the work done. They've got a strong work ethic. That they're they're humble. They're 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 they've got the humility. They're not ego centered, and they're really smart. Right. That's not the, that's not the IQ. That's really the EQ piece. You know that they really are smart about how their their words and their actions and how they impact others. And in the right. book, um, I really highly recommend it because it really talks about why you need all three, and how mm -hmm. leaders can really make sure we're building that and we're focusing on all those different uh, different types of people and even if they don't have all three the people that you have how can you build that so how can you use it to identify when you're hiring and then how to develop your team players along the way awesome and how long of a read was this for you karen is this something somebody could do in a weekend is this oh. a couple of weeks 
absolutely we can. It's a very easy read. And you know, and if you don't want to read it, you can, I think you can listen to it. And he even has a great pod, you know, a couple of podcasts. He does a great talk on this. Awesome. And he, yeah, and he'll talk about, he talks about how, you know, some of the pitfalls, you know, that if, if someone has like one out of three of those virtues, kind of what happens. So okay, it's cool. when you're really trying to build a team and make sure you have team players as part of that team, uh, which is such an important part to grow in the franchise. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important you don't have a bunch of people working in silos. Absolutely. Great. Well, I am so excited to take a look at that book. And as I told you before, I love to um, listen to books through Odyssey or whatever you happen to uh, use as your um, book. Of what I call, I want to call it a book player, but that sounds so much like a record player, which dates <laughs> it me. does. I don't know what to call it anymore, right? I, the, how I you know. stream your yeah. books. I think that's what you say, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to talk more this month about just, you know, what to do when selecting the right employees. So that's going to really awesome. be for the month. Excellent. Karen, thank you so much. Karen Kimsey Sword with Dale Carnegie. We love having you on. Uh, and, and we'd like to thank everybody today. Um, thank you, especially to Jeff Schoenberg. Um, with uh, supporting strategies. We'd also like to thank Laura Liss of Fran Law, our franchise attorney. Please be sure to like, share, and comment on this episode. And as always, thank you to Karen Kimsey Sword, Ray Pillar, David Kujanic, and Jerry Akers, our million dollar mentors, for their insight and wisdom. I am Kristen Chalmetsi, your fourth million dollar uh, mentor today. And as always, thank you for joining us here on Pillars of Franchising. Be sure to join us again next week at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Have a great week. But we aren't on a track a track cartridge. Just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs>